investors out there uh, in the industry today. Um, and you know, today, today's uh, presentation deals more with shot fabricated tanks, which is different than a bolted steel tank. Shot fabricated tanks are built in a controlled environment uh, where they're tested, uh, where they have um, about the, uh, the, the, the interior and exterior corrosion protection is all uh, you know, under controlled conditions. Um, so that's, you know, that's going to be the basis of design or the basis of our presentation today. Compatibility of materials, I think, is key when we talk about steel tank construction. Flexibilities in designs. You'll see some, some pretty unique applications, I think, in some of the product applications that, that, we, uh, that we have out there today. And then, obviously, 100% uh, recyclability, being able to put something in the ground that we can take back out and utilize, uh, utilize down the road. Codes and standards. Um, that govern water storage and ASME vessels, uh, the one being uh, NFPA 22. I'm sure a lot of you folks out there are in the fire protection uh, business uh, from a specifying standpoint. Uh, it seems like fire protection for mission critical facilities, schools, hospitals. Um, um, you know, we just don't have the, the line pressure to be able to, uh, to have the, the, the duration that we need, the host stream duration that we need on the fire protection side of it. So NFPA 22 is a big part of, uh, of tank construction. AWWA, uh, anything other than UL, uh, we follow AWWA standards for standard for welded steel tanks. Uh, AWWA, AWWA D102 would be for the coating side of it. Again, anything other than a UL storage tank. And then ASME vessels for uh, the pressurized uh, systems that we have out there, process, industrial applications, um, uh, and some of, the, some of the different applications. A steel tank construction uh, is pretty unique uh, in some of, the, some of the equipment that is used there. It's a good size roller uh, that you see. Uh, we actually take a steel sheet, depending on the, the diameter uh, of the tank. Uh, those steel sheets are cut length. Uh, they're put through a roller, uh, and they're rolled into uh, a cylinder. Um, gives it some structural integrity uh, as we uh, start to uh, put together a tank uh, in, the, in the shop. These cylinders get welded together, again, depending on the, the volume of that tank, the diameter of that tank, they get welded together. Uh, and this application is for, at, for most of the atmospheric tanks that you're going to see out there today. Uh, we use a lap weld. So you basically overlap one cylinder uh, into another, uh, and, you, and you, we would weld the, uh, the outside of that tank. Uh, if it's used for water applications or something, uh, something that we know that there's going to be some issues, fire protection tanks, we're going to actually seal weld the inside of that tank as well. Uh, it's, uh, Again, from a specifying standpoint, it's a critical element uh, in the longevity of that tank and, and, and its, and its structural, structural integrity. So this is a good application of them uh, actually putting together uh, some, uh, some of these uh, cylinders to make a, a larger, larger volume tank. Uh, double wall tanks, uh, for instance, um, again, not necessarily in the water side of it, but if there's, uh, if there's a chemical storage uh, vessel that, that you're specifying, uh, it may require uh, even some of these uh, hazardous waste tanks. Um, if you're doing a, um, a fire protection facility for, uh, for an aircraft hangar, for instance, um, and you have uh, a triple, uh, you know, AFFF foam that's used on your fire protection side of it, I mean, you have to have a, a storage tank to be able to capture that water before it goes into the sanitary sewer. So that, that, uh, that storage vessel may be a double wall, and this is actually what we would call a, a double wall tank with a 360-degree wrap. So we would have one vessel and then we would basically wrap that again with another with another sheet of steel. It makes an interstitial um, uh, an annual space within the two walls so if there's any kind of breach uh, within the tank itself, um, the fluid is going to migrate down to that interstice and we'll have a monitoring system in there to check if there's any uh, issues with our with our vessels. So that's a 360 degree wrap. Um, it, on the ASV side of it and even some of the uh, some of the other tanks that are that are utilized out there in the industry today you could have a butt weld where we actually take and uh, uh, make a profile um, prior to the, the cylinders being put together, uh, and they weld that both internally and externally. They could be uh, x-rayed uh, if needed. Uh, a lot of the ASME vessels uh, that are manufactured out there in the field today have 100% radiography um, because, again, it's, it's something that uh, is pretty important from a critical design standpoint to be able to uh, hold any kind of pressure some of these vessels you know, two, three, four hundred psi if they're for steam on the steam side of it. That could even be more than that, especially on the power side of it. There's still a lot of, of, of high pressures uh, in these applications. So uh, being able to put the tank together and have it, again, from the quality control standpoint is pretty critical. 
coatings, um, another, important, another important aspect of any of these steel tank uh, designs and details. Um, blasting, uh, here you're seeing a, a grit blast. There's an SP6 blast uh, and an SP10 blast. An SP6 blast would be a blast that would be used on the exterior of the tank. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a metal blast that's used out there in the industry, and it gets it so that, uh, that, that the, the, the paint that we're using out there in the field uh, actually stays and sticks to the tank. Most of the, the coatings that you see out there today are urethane-based. Uh, there's some epoxy-based uh, systems that are out there, but urethane sort of seems to be the, uh, the, the steel tank industry utilizes a urethane coating in both their P3 uh, and their AC 100 U coatings. Um, so it's, it's pretty critical. SP10 blast is an interior coating. Uh, it's almost a pure white blast where you're getting that metal down to any impurities that are in there um, and creating a, a pattern. So again, so that, that urethane, uh, once sprayed on there, uh, adheres to the surface and stays there uh, forever. I mean, that's, that's sort of, I think anybody uh, in the manufacturing industry wants to make those, uh, make those products that are going to be there for, for uh, a long period of time. Coatings, solid urethane coatings. Uh, most everything that is uh, that is sprayed out there today is no or low VOC. I mean, no volatile organic compounds. So that way, there um, for from a urethane standpoint, urethane comes out of the gun in a two part in a two part process, uh, and it's it dries relatively quickly. So you can put on 15 mils at a time and get up uh, for for like an act 100 use of the steel tank institute. Uh, that's a 75 mil coating. In some instances, we can go to 100 mils uh, from a coating standpoint. Uh, so it's, uh, it's something that's, uh, that's, an, that's pretty much an industry standard, uh, and it's utilized for most uh, of these growth control protection for tanks. Gives you that 10-year warranty, that 20-year warranty, that 30-year warranty from, from the corrosion standpoint. Again, from, from when you're specifying it as, a, as an ASPE engineer, it's something that's, a, that's definitely a critical element uh, in, the, in the specifying process. Interior coatings are the same. We need to know, you know, what's being stored in these in these storage vessels. If it's uh, if it's water, then that the the interior coating needs to be NSF compliant. Um, if it's uh, if it's going to be some kind of a chemical based or some kind of a corrosive type material, we know, you know, again, some of the other things work really well uh, in those applications. Uh, but it could be an epoxy based uh, material that may be utilized a little bit thinner as it comes out of the of the gun, but. Again, it's the same process. SP10 blast. Um, we spray the interior uh, of the uh, of the system so that we get a good uh, a good coating with all the fittings uh, and whatnot, and uh, anything that's that's in there. So most of these um, down cover pipes and all that stuff is put in, you know, obviously prior to the the coating process or prior to the blast process. But you can see that what the you know the, the benefits of having a, a coating and coating materials in there for control, corrosion control protection. Uh, ASME vessels, um, we follow uh, from, a, from a quality standpoint, from a uh, welding standpoint, a welding procedure standpoint, uh, they're ASME vessels, Section 8, Division 1 on the storage tank side of it, uh, and they'll deal with uh, hydrodynamic tanks. So it's, again, it's sort, of a, it's sort of a Bible that is used uh, throughout the industry. Uh, if, you're, if you're an ASME certified factory, uh, that means uh, that there is a gentleman from the ASME um, vessel uh, um, inspection uh, standpoint, uh, he's there pretty much 24-7, living at, li living at the factory, making sure that these standards are followed. Anybody that, uh, that, uh, that welds to ASME standards um, has a certification and has to be recertified, uh, sort, of like, uh, sort of like we do as engineers. I mean, we have to have our CEU credits. They have to have their, their welding credits. So they're continually uh, learning, continually uh, growing with the, with the industry, with the business, the different types of welders that are out there, the different types of weld procedures that are out there. Uh, because when, you, when you're working on power plants and some of these other uh, facilities, I mean, they have some pretty critical weld procedures, some of these fittings that may be seeing, you know, huge temperatures or huge uh, pressure swings uh, in, in the application. ASME products that we talked about could be chemicals, could be liquids, could be gases. Um, at all different types of pressure ratings, if we're going to specify uh, an ASME vessel, um, you know, obviously the, the critical element is, in most of these, is, uh, is the working pressure. Uh, and then we test to one and a half times that working pressure. What so gives us the steel thickness, um, you know, it tells us, you know, uh, from, a, uh, from an installation standpoint, you know, what size base ring do we need to have, what kind of anchor tubes we're looking at from a, 
from uh, from uh, an installation that so we know what to, what to do on the, uh, any kind of site and calculations um, and it gives us a, a good uh, uh, a range. But there's all different types of products: hot and cold water storage tanks. We'll talk a little bit about fire protection tanks, chlorine contact tanks, um, boiler blowdown, uh, air receivers, all on the process side of it. So basically, uh, a pressure vessel is, is just that. Um, it's, it's an ASME rated vessel used on the water, fire, process, HVAC. Uh, in most instances, the pressure vessel has what we would call a two-thirds to one-third um, um, storage, storage capacity. Two-thirds of the liquid that you use it, whether it's, whether it's water, whether it's uh, processed fluid or, or whatnot, and then a one-third air. That's a hydrodynamic tank. So that air blanket, uh, because water is not compressible, air is, that air gives us that, uh, that, that, that volume of water that we need uh, for, uh, for, for, for water applications, for storage, uh, for fire suppression uh, on, that, on that side of it. It could be for surge control. Um, a lot of these uh, process vessels or pressure vessels are used uh, on the pump side of it when you know, we have that we have to get rid of that water hammer side of it. So used in uh, surge control applications, uh, constructed uh, similar to um, uh, the, the regular uh, atmospheric tanks, uh, but you know you can see the main difference here is that we have dish heads uh, with, a, with, a, with an ASME vessel, you know, for obvious reasons. Uh, if we you know, put pressure on an atmospheric tank, you have a flat head, uh, it's just going to belly that head. So the, uh, the, all of these vessels are made with the, these dish and flange heads get welded on there. Uh, fittings, uh, most of the time on the fitting side of it. Uh, from, from, from my standpoint, I like to see uh, flange fittings um, anywhere from a two inch, you know, up into up to 24 inch uh, flanges. We've done 36 inch flanges, but it sort of seems to be the, the best way to, to, to do a vessel when we're when we're specifying any kind of the, the fittings. Materials of construction: um, carbon steel. Um, uh, again, these are all components that would go into a specification. Uh, 304 stainless, 316 stainless. Metal grades, uh, fittings uh, for the most part are flanged, flat raised, or slip on, welded necks. Um, you know, again, pretty pretty flexible, I think, in, in the in the fitting side of it. Uh, and then access, we need to have access to the uh, to the inside of these tanks uh, to, to to cope. For the most part, you know, we don't want anybody going in there after the fact. But you know, for our guys or, or for anybody that's actually manufacturing these systems, still have them get in there to blast the tank, to coat the tank. If there's any kind of internals. Uh, downcomer pipes that need to be installed uh, after the fact, stand pipes, um, diffusers when we talk about thermal energy storage tanks, uh, that we need to have access uh, to that tank, uh, whether it's an electrical or a cylindrical uh, manway. Uh, welding, uh, welding procedures, again, just a, a good example of uh, them putting together uh, tanks at the factory uh, in a controlled environment. Um, just the, the, the processes that are, that are uh, involved in putting these tanks together base rings, um, anchors, and hold downs. Uh, again, this is something that, from a specifying standpoint, we see a lot more of this uh, stay out there in the industry where they're really kind of relying heavily uh, on the tank manufacturer to make recommendations uh, for uh, anchoring uh, and for, uh, for seismic, uh, seismic reasons. So hold down uh, is pretty critical when you're talking about uh, an above ground uh, vertical storage vessel. And you can see here there's a there's a welded base ring uh, on the on the vessel with uh, what's called anchor chairs. Uh, these anchor chairs are, uh, depending on the, the, the diameter of that tank and then the location of the facility, uh, will will we'll specify the proper number of hold down restraints um, for that uh, for that particular vessel, uh, so we don't have any uh, issues with it sliding uh, or tipping over. <laughs> the SME vessels on the you know on the on the hydrodynamic side of it. Uh, for, for various types of applications, um, these are these are actually our, our pressure vessels for, for a water process facility. Um, they could hold uh, aqueous ammonia uh, at water treatment plants. Uh, they could hold a lot of different uh, as well as different types of products. Uh, this is a good uh, a good example of, of an above ground uh, hydrodynamic tank vessel uh, at a treatment facility uh, in Pennsylvania. Boiler blowdown tanks. Um, another application uh, for, for, again, for a critical mission type of facility. These are used a lot in uh, power plants where they're using steam uh, for, uh, for uh, running their, their vertical turbine. Vertical turbines, but basically a blowdown vessel uh, is just that. It helps um, on the scale side of it. 
<clears throat> as um, uh, total dissolved solids tend to build up uh, in a boiler, uh, they need to get, you know, it's a closed loop system, so they need to get out of that, uh, out of that vessel, so they go to a blow down vessel uh, prior to being discharged to, to the sanitary sewer system, because again, it's basically temperature, uh, it helps on the flash side of it, it helps on the surge side of it, um, and they're, they're sized accordingly, so uh, normally they're sized for, uh, you know, being able to discharge that, that total amount of of water in that boiler, uh, so that we have uh, we have capacity to be able to fill that boiler back up and put it uh, put it back online. So boiler blowdown tanks so again use more on the on the power industry side of it, uh, or in some of the, these larger hospital applications where they're using still using steam uh, as their primary source. A good example of a, of a boiler blowdown vessel. So you know a lot of times it, you know these these tanks aren't don't, don't seem as glamorous as they are until you sort of see the internal and and see what uh, what the actual business end of of a of a, of a boiler blowdown vessel is like, and a lot of these applications, um, uh, again from from the power standpoint, these fittings will have separate uh, uh, separate well procedures because there might be some kind of exotic metal that's going on there. So um, the manufacturer needs to follow those uh, adhere to those standards uh, as it's an it's an important part of the of the process as we as we put these uh, these tank and these tank systems. Together, <clears throat> good example of a, a boiler blowdown. Uh, these are what you would call on the, on the left hand picture there. That's called a, a tangential fitting, um, and the, the ability uh, to have a steel tank and be able to weld uh, these fittings in these in these certain uh, uh, applications. Uh, I think is a critical part of uh, again of, of being able to provide the proper equipment for that for that type of application. So it's critical uh, that we know that. Um, being able to get into obviously with the with development of 3D drawings, we can model these these fittings wherever they need to go uh, to be able to get them into the into the proper location. Chilled water storage tanks. Um, these are mainly used uh, again. We keep using that that word uh, mission critical facilities. Uh, so the data center project uh, chilled water storage tanks um, um, are used. Uh, for the for the cooling of the of the service, uh, they're used in uh, um, um, data centers uh, for the most part. Uh, these are this, these are actually uh, 30,000 uh, gallon uh, vessels. Um, that are, that this is a GM factory uh, where they actually brought some of their data centers back from Japan when they when they had that huge issue there with with uh, the tsunami uh, in Japan. A lot of the uh, um, a lot of the people that had their their data centers uh, over there found out that uh, uninterruptible power supply was interruptible uh, because of the uh, you know because of a natural uh, you know catastrophe. Uh, so uh, they just found out how important uh, it was to have a redundancy. So basically, a chilled water tank is a redundant uh, cooling source uh, for these vessels. So if we do have an issue, you know, with that with that data center, we basically have you know all of this water. Uh, in the thermal energy storage tank to be able to back up. Um, if that chiller goes down, um, you know, if there's multiple chillers within the facility and the chiller uh, goes down, it takes, you know, a certain amount of time to get that chiller back on. We get another chiller back on uh, in the process, so we have these thermal energy storage tanks um, that make up that load. Uh, so in the instance of General Motors, they had six 30,000-gallon vessels um, to be able to handle anything uh, that any issues that they had with their chiller. So basically, what would happen is we would uh, you know turn away from the chiller, go right to our thermal energy storage tank. Uh, we would start pulling that cold water uh, off the bottom of this vessel. It could be, uh, in most of these instances, a thousand gallons a minute for a certain period of time. Uh, so it's um, uh, that, that's why you see the diffusers uh, in the bottom of this tank. So we don't want to. Uh, we don't want to agitate that water, uh, and then as it returns uh, into the tank, it's obviously going to be warmer after that cooling process. So we basically want gravity uh, to sort of set in here and allow that uh, that thermal climb to build, or that difference between the my discharge temperature and my return uh, water. Uh, it's going to sort of create a blanket within that tank, and we want that blanket to be stable as it moves uh, as it moves through, so that we're utilizing that full 30,000 gallons of water uh, in these vessels. So a lot of engineering, um, again, a lot of engineering and design for these systems. Uh, basically, the business end of these thermal energy storage tanks are the diffusers. <clears throat> we, we need to know the temperature differential uh, when we're designing these, and we need to know the flow rating. Uh, and obviously, the working pressure is, is uh, basically going to be your pump pressure. 
good example of, of some thermal energy storage tanks uh, that are basically out there in the field. Uh, most of them are vertical in application. This one actually has insulation on there. That's three inches, three inches of insulation uh, on the storage vessel. Um, there's um, thermal wells, uh, those, all those little uh, connections and, and uh, cables going up the, uh, uh, the, the side of that tank are all thermal wells. Um, and that basically tells us, you know, when we're, when we're discharging that tank, it tells us exactly where our temperature is and if we are, you know, if we are consistent and where that thermal client is developing uh, if we get into a, uh, into a catastrophic failure with a chiller or we're actually, uh, you know, online with these, um, with these uh, uh, process vessels. So pretty unique uh, in the design, um, but definitely a lot of uh, engineering uh, going on in there. A flash tank, um, yeah, I'm not going to get too crazy on, on this side of it, again, more, more in, the, in the boiler application where you would have um, it's sort of a safety valve or a safety factor for the sanitary sewer system. Um, you, have, you, know, you have a steam boiler it's used in the steam application, um, and you get what's called flash, uh, and you know a flash off of, of steam into the tank, and basically that flash tank uh, turns that steam uh, into into condensate, and then and again it could, could be quenched with some water, and we would we would be able to return that water to the to the sanitary soup. So pretty pretty again uh, engineered system. Um, this one, <laughs> I always like showing this uh, this uh, photo here. This is not uh, this is a project that we did for the military. They didn't really tell us exactly what it was for. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't our guys practicing welding or, or you know, anybody out there. So pretty unique uh, in its design and detail. But you can just see the the, the just the, the beefiness of the fittings. And um, this was just prior to it to, to the tank being tested uh, at the factory. So it just goes to show you some of the uh, some of the you know the, 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 the cool things that that can go on within a within a design or within a detail. But just the the, the quality that that needs to um, you know, that that everybody sort of needs to have you know when. When you know when you're specifying these kind of products, because uh, they are again a vessel is is uh, you know you put air on any tank, it, it doesn't make any difference whether you're testing it or not. Um, you know that thing. You know you, we don't want to have that those those uh, end caps coming off as projectiles. Uh, you know anywhere you know, throughout the process. So it's something that uh, that all the steel tank manufacturers take uh, take to heart and they're very uh, cognizant of when we're when we're building these systems. Uh, air receivers. Uh, air receivers are just that. You have a compressor. Uh, you know, or compressed air uh, within a facility, um, and basically you need a bladder tank. You need like a storage vessel so that compressor is not coming on uh, and working. You know, 24/7. You have a you know a storage of air, uh, you know, within a facility to be able to again take the peaks off of that, so you're not slamming that compressor on and off all the time. Um, but it could be used in, in any kind of process or industrial applications where air is used. Air tools are used uh, out there in a, uh, in a facility. It could be horizontal. Uh, it could be vertical uh, in nature, but it's it's uh, similar in fashion. You're going to have some kind of a condensate drain on the bottom. There's there's no bladders in in these it's just a regular vessel, um, and it's showing uh, uh, air lines, uh, you know, as it's coming off the vessel. But again, it's just you can go with a smaller compressor uh, and a larger uh, air receiver, um, it gives you some some buffer, and it sort of saves on on cost uh, cost and uh, and efficiency. Another smaller uh, type of uh, industrial uh, air receiver uh, here uh, in, uh, in process. Again, just another another application of, a, of an air receiver with our, our proud proud guys. Uh, the fire protection side of it, uh, uh, you know, the fire protection tanks are, are again another another a critical aspect um, uh, in a in a detail of, of any of these buildings. Uh, in this application, again, this is that, that two-thirds to one-third. So, um, you know, if, if you're looking at uh, um, a, a 20,000 gallons, we need 20,000 gallons of usable water. This would actually be a, a 30,000 gallon pressure vessel that we would have to specify because, again, you would have that two-thirds to one-third, that one-third of air that's actually pushing uh, that water uh, through the process if we do have, uh, you know, some kind of a breach or some kind of a, a fire and we need that fire suppression. Um, so, you know, when we're looking at uh, and uh, you know any of these vessels if for if it's a standalone tank, uh, you know you need that compressor uh, to to be able to push that water uh, through the facility. In some instances, if we do have uh, you know underground applications, it might be that line pressure uh, that we're using to uh, to flow water through the end. That's basically you know more of a more of a storage vessel because they might not have the capacity. So I think from a design standpoint, you really need to work uh, you know with a manufacturer that understands the 
you know, that process so that we can help uh, in, in uh, steering everybody in the right direction and getting that proper size and understanding you know, the, the process. So, again, in that instance, you, you know, you would need to know what your, uh, what your line flow is um, and what your host stream is uh, and your duration. Uh, that's very, very important. And then whatever, whatever flow rates uh, that are needed uh, throughout the system to be able to start that compressor uh, properly. But if I've got an application from a, from a pressure vessel standpoint, Obviously, this is in a, in a little warmer climate than, uh, than uh, both, uh, probably most of you guys and, and myself are in. So uh, it's an above ground application uh, with no insulation and no, uh, <coughs> and no heating. <coughs> Excuse me. Another uh, example of a hydropneumatic tank um, in this application, uh, it's, a, a, it's an above ground tank uh, with, with actually the, the head of the tank going through a, a pump out. And there's the business end uh, of that tank. We have a sight glass um, showing us the, the, uh, the volume uh, within that tank. And again, these are all uh, NFPA requirements. Um, we have the uh, we have the air pressure uh, uh, on the tank, or the, the air line going into the tank. And just to the left of that, you can see our pressure gauge uh, in the tank. There's an elliptical manway uh, inside of that facility uh, to be able to uh, access that tank if there was any need to access that tank. Uh, and then you would have your discharge uh, off the bottom of that tank in that building. All your valves and fittings and piping and everything, uh, everything else are, are protected uh, and are secure in a pump house. But that's, that's a pretty that's a pretty standard application, I think, uh, for the you know for these type of tanks. And that, that could even be an atmospheric tank. Uh, in between that, the uh, concrete wall is uh, is what we call a water stop, where we'd actually weld a ring around that. Uh, around that tank so that we'd be able to uh, put some kind of an expansion joint in there uh, uh, for that uh, for that wall to sit on or for that wall to sit around that tank so that it's secure and it's not uh, causing any issues structurally uh, with the tank itself. Some underground storage tanks, although these say uh, atmospheric uh, underground storage tanks, these are for a facility, uh, it's, it's for a hospital, it's for basically for, uh, for water for the facility, but it was also for emergency water. So uh, I, know the, I know the new, uh, some of the new Boca codes um, that we're going to see, um, I think, uh, I'm not sure if it's 2020, uh, but most of your mission critical facilities, and again, I, I keep saying that, uh, that term, uh, but that could be your, that could be hospitals, that could be any facility where the personnel needs to stay there in a, in a catastrophic event. There's a, you know, anything that happens, uh, you know, God forbid, uh, you know, nuclear accident, or, you know, anything like that, these, these facilities need to stay open. Uh, if there is a, a break in the water line, if there is uh, if there's an issue with their sewer infrastructure, they need to have water uh, at these facilities. That's what these tanks are doing. So uh, under normal operating conditions, these tanks are storage vessels and they're in the, in the municipal process line, uh, and they might be 60, 70 PSI um, of Full of water going through these tanks and underground tanks. So basically, it's just a bulge. Uh, it's a bulge in the pipe. But if we had a catastrophic failure with that water line, uh, these tanks would would shut down. Uh, they would actually go to atmospheric pressure. And on the bottom, those little blue, uh, uh, they're they're actually um, uh, uh, fitting protectors. Uh, there's actually those are your suction lines off the bottom of those tanks. We would have a a booster pump on the inside of that facility that would be on, uh, you know, a generator or some kind of an interrupted power source, and those tanks would be basically storage vessels, uh, be able to provide water to that facility for two days or three days or whatever uh, that uh, that building code tells us that we need to uh, to have for for backup. So, in most of those applications, when you're doing hospitals and these these facilities, you have to have water backup water. You have to have backup sewer. And you have to have backup power, so it could be it could be propane, it could be uh, uh, oil, uh, you know, it could be uh, you know any, anything that's going to be able to provide. It could be diesel, uh, anything that's going to be able to provide power to that facility uh, if there's some sort of catastrophic failure within the infrastructure itself or the building or you know or whatnot. So we're seeing that see a lot more of these these type of applications. It's sort of a dual sort of a dual purpose tank. Stainless steel tanks in some applications, uh, we're, we're getting into you know some corrosive materials or some exotic uh, areas, some uh, some sort of uh, you know could be food grade uh, application. Uh, but stainless steel uh, on an ASME uh, pressure side of it uh, isn't isn't always the norm, but it just kind of shows you some of the some of the other applications uh, that are out there uh, that can be uh, that can be done with uh, any of these type of vessels. 
<clears throat> chlorine contact tanks um, for, for some of these states that are that are that are actually uh, surface water states, meaning that they derive more than 50 percent of their uh, drinking water from surface water. Uh, there could be, uh, I know New Jersey is a big surface water state, uh, Pennsylvania, I mean, obviously go down south. Um, I'm sure uh, parts of Ohio uh, are, are, would be considered surface water states, but the chlorine contact tank um, uh, goes directly to um, uh, the EPA for log treatment for drinking water. So uh, if you're upgrading a, 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 a pump station or anything like that, you're using uh, you know, and that water needs to be disinfected, uh, and for the most part, everybody's gone. Uh, have to go to that to that four log treatment meeting. Uh, that you know, there's there's a certain amount of uh, contact time you know within a vessel to be able to get us to that to, to that treatment. So it's, it's always it's a, it's about treatability. Uh, you know, again, when, when we see these tanks uh, out there uh, in uh, in operation, and, and don't, you know, don't always understand exactly what's going on on the inside of them. But um, there's a baffling factor in any of these, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in any of these chlorine contact tanks, and this is this is uh, just a good example of, of baffling factors and basically what we're talking about when we look at uh, uh, designing some of these systems. Um, obviously, you know, we don't want poor circulation. We want to try to get the best circulation in the most efficient tank possible because it goes directly to size, uh, sizing of these systems. Um, and there's basically a, a pretty simple formula for calculating. Uh, chlorine contact tanks. It's uh, it's all based on time. I need a certain amount of time, um, you know, within that tank uh, based on my flow rating um, and uh, my baffling factor to get me to that to that treatment for that four log that four log treatment on the back end. And that's going to go directly to that to that first uh, facility being serviced. So it's pretty important uh, in most of these applications. Uh, and basically, a baffling factor is just that. There's a bunch of baffles. Uh, you know, within the tank, within the tank system, uh, for the most part, what you see uh, as a as a standard is, a, is what we would call a 0.5 baffling factor. So, if you saw um, you know, from the from that previous slide that I had on there, 0.5 is, is okay, but basically it's it's saying you know I, I, it's only giving me a 50% you know, of efficiency that I would need uh, within the tank. Um, 0.7 baffling factor is required by New Jersey. Uh, in some parts of Pennsylvania, we're seeing that Colorado uh, is going to a 0.7 baffling factor, which just means that uh, you know I'm 20% I'm more efficient by putting two perforated baffles uh, uh, within within that tank, within my inlet and my outlet, to get me better mixing. So it's sort of the exact opposite of what we uh, what we try to think about when we're talking about separation and you know, oil water separators and grease interceptors, and, and we need you know, we want to be able to quite, you know, have quite some flow and separate the material with them for the chlorine contact tank, we're doing just the opposite. I want to agitate that flow. I want to keep it in that tank uh, as long as I can through that torturous path and make it uh, uh, as, as, as um, viscous as, as possible to be able to, uh, to again, to get that good contact time and to be able to, and basically, if, if, if you think about it, if I have you know, the difference between 0.5 and the 0.7, I said it was 20%. That just means that my tank is 20% smaller if I'm going to a more efficient type of design. So. It works and uh, you know works in a couple of different ways, so pretty uh, pretty efficient. <clears throat> Underground applications uh, again similar to you know to any of the above ground applications it's going to have the same pressure reading. We're going to have the same type of fittings. The only major difference is going to be the uh, corrosion control protection on the above ground. Um, you know we're actually you know not not, not as concerned. I Maybe mean, we are still concerned with corrosion, but not as concerned. So you know as soon as we go underground, we're looking at those STI coatings. Um, you know, and again, that, that, are, that are proven, you know, third-party tested, third-party warranted, um, and you know, anything that that we need to do. Um, so, so this is actually a, a you know a vessel going through again through the through the side wall of a building. We see a lot of these applications here in the Northeast when you know, again we can't have those tanks above ground because they're just going to freeze, or there's issues with freeze protection. So we would have those penetrating through a building uh, with a water stop expansion joint around that. Around that water stop to be able to uh, again protect the coatings and protect the, the facility uh, and the tank it, and the tank itself. Hot and cold water uh, applications. Uh, there's it, 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 again it just goes to uh, goes to coatings. It goes to uh, internals. Uh, it goes to um, um, you know the type of of, of legs. Am I going to have a leg on the? Do we need legs on the tanks? Is there is there some kind of a Height restriction, you know, where are my fittings going? Uh, you know, these are all 
um, things that we talk about like that, that we need to be specifiable. Uh, on the hot water side of it, you know, if, if it's for an NSF application, or, you know, or for, if it's for hot water, for, uh, you know, for showers and whatnot, then that, that internal lining has to be NSF compliant. Uh, you know, I'm saying about the cold water side of it, you know, understanding the linings, you know, that we need to, that we need to put in here when, when we're specifying these products. Um, you know, again, it's just, it's just uh, food for thought uh, as we work through these, these, uh, these, these projects. <clears throat> when we get above ground or we get it into the, into the atmospheric side of it, uh, an atmospheric, atmospheric water storage tank, uh, you know, it's just that. It's, it basically has, you know, minimal to no pressure uh, on that for the most part. Uh, it could be a fire water storage tank just sitting there uh, with a pump off. Uh, it could be a water tank. Uh, stormwater systems, um, sort of a, a big, uh, big topic as of, as of like stormwater, stormwater management, uh, retention and detention tanks. When we get into the mission critical facilities and other applications is decon tanks. You know, any hospital or, you know, healthcare facility out there, you know, has some sort of a decontamination tank on there for, again, for that. You know, for that catastrophic, uh, you know, that, that 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 event that we you know that we never want to see happen, you know, a chemical attack or you know, a chemical uh, you know facility that you know that that you know, that has a, has an issue, um, you know, helps to require this these deep contacts. Rain and gray water systems again. Uh, when we talk about water stormwater management, um, water reuse. You know, when we're looking at our water infrastructure. Um, you know, just those these sustainable products that. Projects and products that we have uh, that are out there, you know, uh, in the field today are, are, are all part of the uh, atmospheric storage side of it. Uh, atmospheric storage tanks, uh, for the most part, um, have a consensus standard, and you know, other than the, the ones that we talked about earlier, um, basically from a quality control standpoint, uh, an above ground storage tank utilizes uh, UL142, whether it's vertical or horizontal. Um, and it, it gives us uh, steel plate and thickness. It gives us uh, welding details, you know, as we talked about, uh, bulkhead bracing openings. It's, it's, it's our quality control standard. It's, it's the <coughs> excuse me, quality control standard um, you know, that, that's used out there uh, in the industry today. In some instances, when we're talking about water tanks uh, and wastewater tanks and that sort of thing, uh, we can build uh, uh, the tank. They're always built to that UL standard. But I maybe cannot put that label on there because UL tells us you know, I can't put fittings in, you know, like on the bottom shell of the tank. I mean, the UL is more for uh, for fuel storage, but it's still something that is utilized as a quality standard uh, because it's just uh, it's mainstream, it's and it's um, it's repeatable, and it's just something that that we're used to doing. Even though we can't do it, it might be an AWWA label on some of the UL 142, but I wanted to just you know let you guys know that that in some instances. Um, somebody, uh, from a specifying standpoint, somebody might say it's going to be a UL-142 water tank. But there's really no such thing. We cannot put that label on there, although we can build it to that standard, uh, just, just for a, a point of clarification. Uh, underground tanks, again, the national consensus standard for underground tanks is UL-58. Again, similar kind of a, uh, kind of a concept there where that UL standard is basically a fuel storage tank, flammable bulk combustible liquids, uh, we still make uh, all of our tanks to that UL58 standard. Um, it doesn't make any difference if it's water, fire, process, you know, whether I can put that label on it or we can put that label on it, or the industry can put the label on it or not. Uh, it's still, it's our, it's our Bible. It's, it's our way that, that we make uh, these storage tanks. It's, it gives us, uh, it gives us metal thickness, um, you know, shell seams, because um, there's a lot more things going on in an underground tank that we need to, you know, that we need to deal with whole down in a buoyancy calculation. Rourke calculations for, for steel thickness when you get to, you know, 20 something feet in the ground. Um, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's pretty important that we, uh, that we make these uh, so that they're going like, to last and they're going to, they're going to do what we need them to do for, for, uh, for a long period of time. <coughs> Atmospheric storage systems, um, you know, when we look on the, you know, from the, from the above ground side of it, uh, again, it could be the same as, as pressure side of it, water storage. Uh, fire storage, uh, wastewater storage, uh, process water, uh, for the most part, and uh, you know, as we talked about, and again, sort of that that hot button is uh, is the stormwater management side of it. So, got a lot of different types of applications. Uh, recently, just did a really nice presentation down in from the Aspie, Philadelphia, uh, on, uh, on on fire tanks and fire tank applications, um, which is which is you know, again, it's it's a it's a big part of any you know any kind of building design. Uh, 
um, you know, getting into these urban areas and, uh, you know, in, even in some of these, you know, a lot of these rural areas where these big structures are being put in and there's just, there's either, you know, little water or if there's water there, I mean, I hear this more times than not, you know, it's like, oh, we've got water, but it's only, you know, it's only coming in at 20 PSI. You know, you got a, you know, 20-story building uh, that's, uh, you know, just not going to be able to, you know, number one, you're not going to be able to build it unless you can, you know, figure out that you, know, you need to have these, uh, you know, this infrastructure uh, as a backup. So it's it's pretty important. Uh, it's, it's a pretty important element from the from the design side. But this is just a, a fire suppression tank uh, for a, for a vertical turbine pump. And again, for the fire side of it, uh, we need to know duration and we need to know um, the flow, and that's going to give us the, that storage side of it. So for the most part, it's 100%. Um, you know, with an atmospheric tank, I can get almost all of that water out of there. Uh, and in this instance, I can do that by having that uh, that sump on the bottom. So that vertical turbine is going to go all the way down through there. So I'm going to have a flood suction uh, the whole way. Uh, so it's pretty important to do a wet well application, you know, similar to this design, where that vertical turbine pump, you put a pump house over the top of it or it come through the, you know, the, the basement of a building. Um, you know, you would need to have, a, you know, a fill line, uh, you know, per NFPA, a ladder, uh, vent. Uh, venting is probably the you know the one thing that's sort of uh, missed, uh, or the, the issues that we see with most of these atmospheric tanks. Somebody's trying to choke down that that vent, or not understanding you know the you know the, the, the properties you know of a, a properly vented tank. And again, when you're you know, when you're pumping water in there or pumping water out, you know we have that you know, we, you, know you want that air or that or that vacuum uh, release or relief. So Venting is uh, is pretty critical uh, in any of these applications, uh, and then just install it, installing the uh, you know, the bottom stump uh, on there. They're getting a little creative uh, in their in their application because the stump was so long uh, in this application, so it's pretty. And there is just the the, the tank being uh, installed uh, in the ground. Suction tanks. You know, we saw the pressure vessel uh, on the suction side of it. The same with the atmospheric tank. It, it could be uh, used in the same way, where we have, you know, that storage of water uh, that's sitting there, uh, whether it's for, for backup water uh, or for backup fire protection. Um, we would have a, a you know a booster pump or some kind of a pump, you know, coming off the the head of that uh, that's the head of bottom head of that tank. Uh, we might need an anti vortex plate on there uh, for the most part on any of our. Fire protection tanks, you know, you're talking 500 gallons a minute, 1,000 gallons a minute, 2,000 gallons a minute. Uh, you don't want to create, uh, you know, any kind of vortex uh, within that, you know, decapitate that pump. We want to be able to have that, you know, that constant stream of water going through there unimpeded uh, to, the, to, the, to the booster and then, you know, obviously uh, into, the, uh, into uh, the system for fire protection. A uh, hold down restraint uh, on an underground tank. Uh, again, this goes directly to, uh, you know, to you guys as from a from a specification standpoint. Um, you know, being able to have buoyancy calculations, you know, understanding you know, again, UL tells us the steel thickness for a tank up to five feet of overburden. You know, anytime we get into more than that, um, you know, it's, it's it's something that we need to look at from a steel thickness standpoint. Because uh, for the most part, uh, when you're talking about hold down restraint systems, you know it's it's being calculated at the worst possible condition. So meaning that this 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 uh, this excavation is totally underwater, uh, and that tank is empty. And that's how that uh, any of these uh, hold down systems and buoyancy calculations are done. So we figure on the worst possible conditions. And you know if you've ever done any work in Florida, we call them uh, bathtub installations, where you basically go in and you're trying to dewater the site. Um, and uh, you know that tank is basically below the below the water level, uh, so there's straps. Um, there's whether it's a hold down pad. In this in this instance, you're seeing dead men, uh, you know, down the side of the tank. Um, again, it's just adding to the overburden. It's something that you know needs to be addressed um, uh, you know, from a specifying standpoint, and it needs to be addressed in, in the proper fashion. And that's again leaving that up to the tank manufacturers. Is for the most part what we see as a, as a standard. Cistern tanks, uh, you know, these would be more in your in your rural areas where uh, there's no water or no water supply, and we need to have you know that that uh, 30,000 gallons or that thousand gallons a minute for 30 minutes. Uh, again, you're seeing the, the proper uh, application where if I'm going from left to right, I have my fill uh, with a standpipe. Uh, we have access to the tank uh, if needed. Uh, in the middle, I have a vent and level gauge combination vent and level gauge, uh, so that we can it's a visual type of thing, so you can just 
kind of walk by it or drive by it if it's the fire marshal held up that tank full of water, and then we have that Siamese connection for the pump or the, or the tanker to be able to come up and uh, hook up to that and use their pump uh, onboard pump to be able to uh, do any kind of fire. Uh, fire. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, just a good example uh, again of uh, we talk about um, you know, understanding where these tank and these tank systems go. I guess just the, the depth of bearing. Uh, here's a good example of uh, you can just tell by the cuts. You know, in this application, that's a 50,000 gallon storage tank. It kind of looks small in that uh, in that crater, but um, you know, it's it's uh, understanding that the, you know, the proper steel thickness, um, you know, the proper you know, venting, uh, getting you know, getting access to the tank, you know, to grade. These are all things that need to be you know thought of um, you know when when these things are being specified, so that we're specifying you know, the proper products, and making sure that again, once it goes in the ground, you know, it's going to stay there. We're not going to have any issues with uh, you know uh, with access with hold down. Uh, buoyancy, steel thickness, raw calculations, uh, you know, and all that good stuff. But just a good example of a large volume cistern, you know, above ground tanks, you know, on the atmospheric side of it. You know, again, this is not in a in a freeze uh, predicted area, but there's a, a pump house where the head of the tank would go through the pump house, manifolding tanks together to get the uh, to get the uh, the proper volume. For the most part, the shot fabricated tank, the largest, you know, for the most part, that's covered under you also sixty thousand gallon tank. So. Uh, you know, obviously there's instances where there could be 200,000 gallons worth of storage, so those tanks would just need to be manifolded together to uh, to get those to get that proper uh, that proper volume. Double wall tanks uh, for, from a fire side of it, MFPA. As so we're in those colder in those colder climates, we need to be able to uh, um, heat those tanks. These are double wall tanks that are actually insulated uh, with a with a heater uh, inside. Stormwater tanks. Um, it's been a, Definitely been uh, over the last couple of years a, a hot topic, or you know, getting uh, I think more more mainstream. Uh, anytime you know any building is being done, you know I know again here and uh, up and down the, the, the northeast, you know we have issues with stormwater. You know too many, uh, you know too many of these you know hundred year storms have been coming through, and there's just basically no way to build a bigger wastewater treatment plant or or, or water treatment plant here and. Um, you know, in the in New England, you know, we have a ton of combined sewers. So you have a big, huge storm event, and we have a uh, you know a sanitary sewer overflow or a combined sewer overflow, if you will. So retention and detention, and we just you know just we just can't put um, you know detention ponds out there uh, anymore. So uh, require it for um, for you know being able to shave off that that peak flow or that peak uh, storm event. Storing so storing it in a in a tank, whether it's two or three stories down in the building. Um, it's pretty important um, uh, to be able to uh, uh, to be able to meet the needs of that of that uh, that infrastructure. Um, just a couple of uh, larger rectangular uh, systems here um, in uh, New York City, manifolding tanks together to be able to uh, you know capture that storm and then getting getting creative with uh, you know with stormwater uh, and stormwater detention uh, and retention. Uh, but again, most of these are going uh, inside of the building because there's just no. You know, there's no if, if, if whether it's a zero watt line in, in New York City, you're not going to have any, you're not going to have any green areas. So being able to utilize, you know, a tank to be able to take off that that peak flow is is uh, critical. And it's, it's one of the first things that gets put into a building. It's probably a couple stories down uh, in that facility. Uh, decontamination tanks, are, you know, are pretty straightforward. Um, you know, for the most part, whether they're underground or above ground, it's a, it's a double wall tank. Um, it's going to valve on there so that we can direct. Um, you know the, the normal flows to the sanitary sewer. If we have, if we do have that issue, um, you know where we have a you know catastrophic failure or um, you know uh, you know that, that so that sort of a uh, issue, then you know the tank is going to be able to capture a certain amount of water and store it. And then whether it gets, it's going to get pumped out of there, um, there's a float in there. There's a double wall sensor to be able to tell us a uh, control panel, uh, you know, to tell us what's going on. Uh, but uh, they are critical parts of, of, uh, of that facility. Our rainwater harvesting, um, for the most part, stormwater management, rainwater harvesting has been, uh, you know, been a huge issue. Um, um, something that we've seen not only just from a, from a lead standpoint, uh, but from you know, from combining the two. Uh, there's, a, there's, I think, a lot of these projects are done uh, for lead, but a lot of them now are being done on the stormwater management and then on the water quality side of it too. I mean. You know, again, just looking at the, the today's uh, ASPE magazine, uh, you know, our infrastructure, you know, has some serious issues. So being able to sort of go offline and 
have a you know a decentralized uh, system for for water uh, for non potable water uh, has been has been pretty big. So manufacturers out there today are doing you know, complete package systems. So you guys as as specifiers. Um, you know, sort of can rely, I think, on, and there's there's a bunch of manufacturers out there that are that are really you know kind of know what you know know what's going on within these systems, and if you've ever ever done one, you know, you really need to, I think, you know, rely on on that. Um, you know, again, because the parts and pieces, the days of getting parts and pieces, um, you know, are, are, I think are, have gone by us. It's not like it's a proprietary, it's not like a proprietary design, because um, again, everybody sort of has the the parts and pieces and the storage vessels. Um, you know, being the most expensive part, um, you know, from from the storage from the storage side of it, but being able to package the system, relying on a manufacturer to be able to package that system. So, uh, from a cost saving standpoint, from a footprint standpoint, from a testing standpoint, uh, you know, that's that's uh, you know, you're relying on the manufacturer to to be able to do that, and it's a performance standard rather maybe than a than a than an equipment standard. So it takes a little, little bit of a a pressure, I think, off of off of the specifying engineer, but um, and then you you know it's, it's that liability thing too. You're you're making sure that it's it's one person that you're pointing the finger at, you know, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. So just something to think about. But pumps, you know, uh, again, I'm not going to get too crazy. Uh, this is a whole a whole other presentation uh, all in itself. But um, I'm not going to get too crazy. I think on the design design elements. But if you guys have ever done these, you know, obviously there's First flush filters, there's storage, there's pumps. You know, we need to pump water uh, out of these tanks systems to get them inside of the building. Um, there's floating suctions um, that are that are on these pumps. Uh, when we get above ground skid mounting, uh, can't say it enough. Being able to package these this equipment um, to be able to get it to the site so that the mechanical contractor can easily put it together. Single plane connections. Uh, you know, two control panels uh, is uh, is a is a pretty critical element. Um, combining uh, the you know the equipment uh, here is so a filtration skid, you know, with a day tank, um, uh, an all inclusive uh, type of system where you would have a day tank, all your filtration, all your disinfection, it's all piped at the factory. It's it's uh, just something that uh, you know we see uh, you know sort of as a mainstream element and, and specifications throughout the country. Uh, that are done, you know, that are done every day. But being able to package, you know, and have that that package design um, is uh, is pretty key uh, element in, in any of these type of systems. Filtration and disinfection that would go directly to, you know, who's ever going to inherit this system to. That's, um, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, that that you know, when, when you're designing the system, working with the manufacturer that you know, sort of understands the, the process and you know what's you know again what is good for that for a school, you know, might not be good for uh, you know, for a hospital, or it might not be good for a data center. You know, or it might not be good for, you know, a, a, you know, a closed-loop process industrial application. So, understanding the process, testing. Uh, you know, can't say it enough. Uh, in that specification, you know, again, it's just not. It's, it's all manufacturers. You know, sort of need to help be held accountable uh, for that equipment, uh, and that goes directly to commissioning. Um, if this stuff is tested at the factory. You know, wired at the factory, plumbed at the factory, and tested at the factory. Um, it goes directly to um, you know ease of use, uh, you know, out there and uh, troubleshooting. So um, making sure that, that it's tested and, and uh, put out there and, and done right is is key. Um, you know, mechanical rooms. You know, obviously, in some instances, you need you know some room for for the equipment, and then some instances it can go into uh, you know a little hot box. Um, you know, this is an irrigation system. Um, out on a pad, um, you know, obviously it's in Florida, but that's an insulated um, structure, so it could uh, you know, could have heat in there to be able to house, um, you know, all of this uh, all of this equipment. And there's you know there's a lot going on in some of these instances. Uh, pumps, pumping, um, for the most part, pumps and, and controls uh, could be whatever that facility is utilizing for pumps. Uh, but from a control standpoint. Um, you know, the PLC controllers are, are sort of the everyday now. Um, you know, it's, it's very rare that you're going to see you know a bunch of uh, HOA switches uh, in any of these these type of systems because basically it's a it's a little science part. You, know, you need to be able to get in there and know your levels, be able to set your levels, uh, turn your pumps on and off through you know through a touch screen. Um, and it's going to be PLC control that goes directly to when they can change anything within the process. You know, while we're at that facility. Uh, it can be easily uh, done through the touchscreen or by just basically 
you know, hooking your laptop up to the uh, uh, you know, up to the PLC. Uh, just sort of finishing up here. I know I'm getting right towards the, the 60 minute mark, uh, but uh, gray water, gray water recycling um, uh, is is another uh, you know sort of another hot topic. Um, Rainwater uh, is, is, is unique in the fact that we store rainwater, then we treat it. Uh, with gray water, uh, it's just the opposite. I need to treat it first and then store it. And we only store it for, you know, for most of the, part, most of the time, 24 hours to, to uh, 48 hours uh, at the most. Um, uh, the beauty of gray water is that it's sort, of a, it's sort of a known source. We know, you know how much we're going to get every day. We know what we're going to use that water for. So uh, being able to, you know, clean that water up. Uh, is, is again, it's a process. It, depending on you know what we're doing, uh, there could be filter, you know, pre-filters involved. Um, a lot of organics in gray water. Uh, gray water is coming from you know from showers. Could be from laundry. It could be you know anything other than you know, the, the, you know from from sinks. Um, uh, so uh, it's it's a, it's a little bit more uh, difficult, I think, to you know to to work with. Uh, you could have carbon filters on there to get rid of your uh, organics. Um, but again, it's it's a process. There's there's things you know there's there's things involved there. There's there's storage vessels. There's pumps, uh, filters, um, controls, um, UV disinfection. Uh, there could be bio filters. You know again to get hair grit, you know whatever whatever out of that uh, out of that waste stream. So it's um, it's pretty unique uh, in its applications. And again, they're packaged systems. It's, it's similar to the to the rainwater side of it. Um, gray water should be uh, you know the same way. So when you guys are specifying. You know, these products we could be pumping up. This is just a wet well to you know, pump up to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to, to the uh, to the system, and then it's uh, another packaged package system, and just on the control side of it. So uh, again, uh, I know it's a lot of uh, a lot of information uh, that you know, to throw at you here uh, in 60 minutes, but appreciate uh, appreciate your time and, and appreciate everybody. Uh, uh, everybody uh, showing up for the, for the occasion. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. You there? Yep. I got you. So, yeah, we're, we'll open up some questions now. Um, we did have one question come in during your presentation. Uh, what info do you need? Uh, to, what, what info do we need to provide Highland Tank for a fire suppression uh, application? Um, on the fire suppression side of it, depending on what you're, um, you know, what we're using for pumps is, is basically duration. I mean, I need to know what your flow is and how long we need that flow for. Uh, so if it's, you know, if it's firing gallons a minute for 30 minutes, that's a 15,000 gallon tank. Um, you know, yeah. 1,000 gallons a minute for 30 minutes, it's 30,000 gallon tank, um, and that's that would be your 100%. So we might need to, you know, bump that tank up a little bit, um, you know, if we, if we can't, you know, if we know we can't get that drain down to the full volume. But it's basically flow and duration. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks again, Michael. Uh, that was a terrific presentation, and uh, thank you all for attending today. Um, we hope you join us for our next class on May 16th. It's going to be covering stainless steel sanitary drains and pipe. Uh, also, later this year, we're pretty excited with uh, our new headquarters. We have a new wet lab, and we'll have uh, two classes that are going to be hands-on. Uh, we hope to have you guys down here and um, attend this. It's going to be really cool. Um, so, yeah, later today, I'll email you your ASPE CEU certificates. Uh, if you don't get it, please uh, give me a call or shoot me an email. Um, I know some of the guests on here didn't really put their full name, so... If you could, just give me a call or shoot me an email. Let me know you were on today's class, and I'll get you a CEU right over to you. And, and as always, if you want to view this recording of this class or any of our previous classes, uh, check out our YouTube channel. Um, we have recordings from every class of Disney McLean University. So thanks again, Michael. That was a great presentation, and thank you all, and hope you have a great week. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff.